can see that TAS is making lasting impact. <laughs> it's leaving a lasting impact. Well, you have nothing to do with it. It's the students. Look at the, the one I had yesterday. If you look at this thing at the back, it's so embarrassing. It's so stupid. <laughs> And, and it really conveys the wrong message. Yeah. Forgot a comma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not according to mine. Let's see my phone. Oh, my phone not here. Well, I think we can start. Uh, before I ask you whether there are questions about last time, let me review what we did last time, so maybe you can have questions now. But I also would like to add uh, something to what I said last time, which I think is actually quite amusing. And it was motivated by the questions I was asked. So the lesson from that already is that the questions I was asked yesterday after my talk uh, stimulated me to say things now that I think will be helpful. And the lesson from that is come and ask me questions. You might benefit, but also I might benefit, and also your friends if it's something that's worth propagating. So this is a lightning review of yesterday. This is a paper I wrote with Meng Cheng. Not so much because I'm talking about it, but because it has a long list of references, and I'm not going to give references here. Then we gave a definition of asymmetry, which was more limited than the definition other people will use here. It's unitary. It commutes with a Hamiltonian, of course. That's the fact that it's a symmetry. It acts faithfully. So we really identify the right symmetry. And it acts linearly on operators. Operators have to transform linearly the Hilbert space might be projective, and that's the simplest sign that there is an anomaly if the Hilbert space is in a projective representation. And we demonstrated it in the two-level system. And there was some discussion uh, whether the two-level system is consistent or not. And I put the point of view, which I think is the correct one, is that the two-level system is a consistent quantum mechanical system. This was perhaps too subtle. Then we discussed the fact that the symmetry in the UV and in the IR could be different. And they could be different in two different ways. There might be symmetries in the UV that do not act in the IR. So this map can have a kernel. And there could also be new symmetries in the IR that are not there in the UV, which means that uh, the group here could be larger. And more mathematically, that's a homomorphism. And then I started discussing the C equals 1 system. And I asked people to raise their hand if they ever heard about it. And honestly, I was kind of surprised by the results. So we'll do the same experiment again today. But before we discuss it, I would like to add something here. Logically, it's here. That was stimulated by a question, with what, by one of the questions I was asked yesterday. So somebody asked me, so we talked about the two-level system, and we said that the symmetry was SO3. And then we said it's enough to consider an O2 subgroup. And in fact, it's even enough to consider a Z2 times Z2 subgroup. And somebody asked me a great question. This is the system, the two-level system. It has a symmetry. Why do you discuss only a subgroup of it? You should use everything you have. And there is no Hamiltonian that is going to preserve the other symmetries, but not the, that's going to preserve the subgroup, but not the full SO3. Take it as an exercise to see that. So why was I talking about another symmetry? I thought in this context, I would give another example of a quantum mechanical system that I really like very much. This is perhaps my favorite one. And that's a particle on a ring. So the Lagrangian is a half Q dot square. I'm in Lorentzian signal, 
pi, theta over 2 pi, dot, is identified with q plus 2 pi. So whenever I have a periodic field in the Lagrangian, I'm always careful to specify the identifications in field space, because otherwise I can rescale the field and trade off the coordinate r here. So the same thing here, I can put an m. So what's the symmetry of this problem? So we follow the same recipe. First of all, what's the symmetry? OK, there's an obvious u1, and it maps q to q plus alpha. And since q is identified with q plus 2 pi, alpha is also identified with alpha plus 2 pi. And therefore, as a group, it's u1 rather than r. And if we apply Nether procedure, we can find a conserved charge, q, which is really the momentum of this guy, of q, conjugate to q, which if you just differentiate Actually, a little bit more precisely, if you apply Nether procedure, this coefficient here is a little bit ambiguous. You can shift it. You can shift q by a spin number, and the commutation relations of q with anything will be the same. Is q not supposed to be squared? Uh, no, thank you. So people are going to get extra for finding mistakes on my board. There will be plenty of opportunities. And, but Oliver is not going to get that credit. <laughs> He's only auditing this class, right? <laughs> so there is an ambiguity in adding a sin number, which is not unlike the ambiguity we discussed yesterday in defining the operators, and we, we also put in a more general context of counter terms. We can always add counter terms to redefine what we mean by the Lagrangian, the coupling background fields, et cetera. And this thing is the same, the same thing. There's an ambiguity here, which we'll soon see be very important. In addition to that, if theta is not generic, imagine theta is 0 mod pi. There is another symmetry, which I can call r for reflection, which takes q to minus q. For theta equals 0, so first of all, theta is periodic with theta plus 2 pi because the winding number is always an integer. And, but also for theta equals pi, pi, pi is the same as minus pi. And therefore, if I apply q goes to minus q, this is a symmetry of the action. This is well known. And you'll soon see why this is connected to what I said. However, if you compute the... the R with Q. Oh, you can't see that. So R with Q with R inverse, which is the same as R, if you just act on P or on Q, you find that it is minus Q plus twice theta over 2 pi. So for theta equals 0, that's obviously a symmetry. For theta not 0, it's a little bit more subtle. For theta equals 2 pi, I can redefine what I mean by q and absorb it in it. So for theta equals, for theta equals 0 mod, pi, mod 2 pi, I can map q to q minus theta over 2 pi. So they call it q prime. And then this is a good symmetry. For theta equals pi mod 2 pi, I cannot do that. And I will soon discuss it in more detail. So what's the group? Since we have both q, which is u1, and r, which is z2, the total symmetry group is O2. What does the spectrum of the Hamiltonian look like? So this is energy. It's a function of theta. And this is 2 pi. And this is pi. The whole thing is periodic. So the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is a bunch of parabolas copied around this. And these guys continue so that the theta equals pi is level crossing. I'm not drawing it very well. Something like this. So for generic theta, all the states 
are not degenerate. But for theta equals pi, the states are doubly degenerate. Now let's understand that as a consequence of an anomaly. We have a symmetry O2. That's a symmetry that acts on the operators. However, for theta not equal to zero mod pi, that's not a symmetry of the problem, so there's nothing to discuss. For theta equals zero mod two pi, the O2 acts linearly on the Hilbert space. H. But for theta equals pi mod 2 pi, a definition like that is not going to work, not going to help problem, the problem here. And then what we have is that Q, if I, I can try to uh, shift it, there will always be a C number here. So if there is a C number here, it's not going to affect how the symmetry, the O2 symmetry, acts on operators. The operators are still in a good linear representation of O2, but the Hilbert space is not. Now, H is in a projective representation One way to see that is to perform such a shift with theta over 2, with, with pi. So we let q goes to q plus 1 over pi. Did I get the pi straight? Plus, plus a half. Yeah. So we can make a shift like that. And that would restore the commutation relations. However, now the charges are not. So say it again. For generic, if I let q be what I said before, around here, theta equals pi, all the charges are half integer rather than integers. And the states still have charge and plus one, plus a half and minus a half. So the charge conjugation transformation or the reflection transformation are x properly, but the u1 is realized projectively. So the upshot of all that is that for theta equals pi, we have an anomaly in O2. Now, what does this have to do with what we discussed yesterday? Imagine we are at theta equals 0 to pi. What's GUV? So GUV, we look at the whole system as a whole. And for theta equals 0 mod pi, GUV is O2. Uh, yeah, it's O2. That's a symmetry. And it might or might not act projectively on the Hilbert space. So that's for zero mod pi. What's GIR? So for generic theta, we have only the U1, so there's nothing to discuss. When theta is zero mod two pi, it is empty, right? The IR person sees only the ground state, and therefore, there's no symmetry that acts on it. That's the end of it. We might turn on background fields and so forth, as somebody asked me, but the low energy observer see, looks there, there's nothing interesting. What's the symmetry for theta equals pi mod? So what does the low energy observer see? The low energy observer sits here, and he or she or they see a two-level system, what we talked about yesterday. So what does the low energy observer say? What is the infrared symmetry? Question. Who is, what is the low energy? What does the low energy observer think the global symmetry is? SO3. So here is our homomorphism, either to 0 or to SO3. And we see examples here of the two phenomena I discussed earlier. There could be symmetries in the UV, and they do not act in the IR. So there is a kernel of the map. We see that when theta is 0. When we are at theta equals pi, we actually see, just one second, more symmetries. There is a new symmetry, an emergent symmetry, that the IR observer sees that goes beyond the O2 that exists microscopically. Question. 
is GIR with the MD setter is the trivial group? What's the difference? Trivial group has uh, one element. This is the identity. So that's a trivial group. Yeah, I, yeah, you're completely right. Thank you. You do get an extra point. <laughs> so that might be surprising. Where did this symmetry come from? It's not there. So an O2 subgroup of eight, the UV observer understands. The remaining symmetries are not exact symmetries in the IR. They are approximate symmetries. If the IR observer look, performs experiments more carefully, they will notice that it's not just two levels that are exactly degenerate with an exact SO3 symmetry, but in fact, there are small violations, tiny violations, suppressed by the energy difference between this state and the next, and the next level. That's the energy scale in the problem. And in fancier language, which is clearly overkill in this case, we would say that there are irrelevant operators in the low energy effective theory that violates SO3, but preserve the O2. That's kind of the definition of an emergent symmetry. In fact, we can go and change our problem and add here a potential. But it could be a more general potential. For example, cosine 2q. Now the u1 symmetry, even for generic theta, the u1 symmetry is broken to z2, only shifting q by pi, not by 2 pi. And for theta equals pi, and for theta equals pi, equals 0 mod pi mod pi, we have z2 times z2. And the discussion of the symmetries and the anomalies and all that is exactly as before. So the UV person. The UV person says, now that we broke the symmetry, we have only z2 times z2, no, no longer O2. So for, gen for generic theta, we have only z2. And for theta equals 0 mod pi, we have z2 times z2. And for theta equals 0 mod 2 pi, the z2 times z2 is realized linearly. And therefore, there's nothing interesting to say about the, state, the system. But for theta equals pi, the z2 times z2 is realized projectively. I can write the algebra. There are two elements in g2 times g2. Call them g1 and g2. And that equals g2 times g1. That's a statement that the symmetry is realized projectively. And therefore, the Hilbert space should realize this symmetry. And since the Hilbert space realizes this symmetry with a minus sign, there are no one-dimensional representations. So without doing any work, we know that the spectrum is such that all the states are at least doubly degenerate. This is a very powerful result, because I didn't tell you anything about the potential. The potential could be any function that has the z2 symmetry. So you can have cosine 2q, cosine 4q, cos cosine 18q, but no cosine 19q. Right? So you can put terms like that. You can, yeah. OK, so that's, that's what we have. Um, and I forgot to say it. I also need v of q equals v of minus q. So let me also add that. So we can't solve the system. For general, such V of Q, we cannot solve the system. It's not so easy. But we know without doing any work that at theta equals pi, all the states have to be at least doubly degenerate. OK, now let's state that. So that's the UV person. Now I'm an IR person. And as an IR person, I look at the low energy state for theta equals 0 
or generic theta is C one state. Okay, there's not much to say. But for theta equals pi, I see that there are two states, and I say, aha, the symmetry is SO3, and it's realized projectively. That's the first approximation. The next approximation is, if I look more carefully, I see that the system has, depending on what I have in the potential, either O2 or, in, or only Z2 times Z2 symmetry. The symmetry, the anomaly, really resides in that Z2 times Z2 subgroup. So the anomaly that we saw in the UV must match the anomaly in the Z2 times Z2 subgroup. And that's a general rule. As I said, this is an example of a toothed anomaly matching. The UV person says the symmetry is Z2 times Z2, and it has an anomaly. The IR person must realize the same anomaly. The IR person might see a larger symmetry group, and the larger symmetry group might have its own anomaly, but that does not reflect anything in the UV. So the points I'm making here will be extremely important down the road. The symmetry that we match between the UV and the IR, only those, the anomaly, only of the anomalies of those symmetry that we match in the UV and the IR should match. We get new symmetries in the IR. They might have their own anomalies, but they have nothing to match with the UV. Okay, so that was in addition to yesterday, which was stimulated by a question that I was asked. Are there any questions about that? Yes? If you just have the IR picture, is there any way to know which anomalies will match? The no, okay. no, because I can write different UV theories yeah. which have different symmetries. So when you say just the IR symmetry, imagine you say all you know is that there are two states. Mm -hmm. And you do experiments. If you do experiments carefully enough, you realize that, so your first guess is SO3. Mm -hmm. And then you do experiments. And if the experiments are carefully enough, you might see that the SO3 symmetry is not quite exact. There are slight violations of the SO3 symmetry reflecting what happens at shorter distances. This is, what, this is the name of the game in high energy physics. In high energy physics, we see the effective theory and we are trying to guess the shorter distance, the UV theory that leads to it. It's the opposite of what's done in, in condensed matter physics. In condensed matter physics, the UV theory is given and you have to find the IR theory. In high energy physics, the IR theory is given. We're trying to guess the UV theory. And then we do experiments like in proton decay. Is proton number an exact symmetry at short distance? So at long distances, it's an ex approx at least approximate symmetry. And then we do experiments to measure the violation of proton decay. And as long as we don't see a violation, we'd say, for all we know, that's an exact symmetry of nature. That might contradict your theoretical prejudice and so forth, but it might also be that there is violation and it's smaller than what, what we knew. Uh, yeah. If I get to it later today, today, you will see a symmetry that exists in the IR, does not exist in the UV, and yet it is exact in the IR. So that's why I emphasize that you go after the violation of the symmetry uh, in the long, the long distance theory should show violations of the emergent symmetry but sometimes the situation is more interesting. More questions? Yes. Yeah, well, the theta equals two pi case. Uh, it's the data uh, cross state to X projectively. Yes. So we say that the IR symmetry will be like the extension of this data. Ah, excellent question. So you could say, you know, that's, I didn't write the correct group. That's what you say. I didn't write the correct group. Yeah, I found G1 and G2, and there is a minus sign here. So the correct group is larger. I should extend G2 times G2, right? That's what you say. But now we go back to my definition. And you see, mathematicians refer to it as the adjectives. The adjectives in the definition are very, very important. So I put a whole list of adjectives there. And I emphasize now the adjective faithful. If you try to say, aha, the symmetry group is different, I should really think of the symmetry group as being G1, G2, eta, G2, G1. And maybe eta square is 1. That would be a nice group to have. And it even has a name. I think it's D4 or something. I'm not sure about the name. But say, OK, that's a symmetry group. But this symmetry group does not act, 
faithfully. Because ADA commutes with all the operators in the theory. ADA commutes with all the operators in the theory. Related to that, ADA is minus one on all the states in the Hilbert space. This, these two statements are synonymous. The fact that theta x commutes with all the operators in the theory means that it is central, and therefore it's like a C number. Related to that, all the operators in the theory have the same value of theta. Of, of sorry, value of eta. So this eta should be thought of as a C number rather than an operator. And indeed, the symmetry acts faithfully, but not linearly. It acts linearly on the operators, but not linearly. It acts projectively on the Hilbert space. These distinctions are very important. More questions? That has nothing to do with the UV. Yes. Where does that come from? Because from the same place that new symmetries came from. So imagine in the UV you have some symmetry, and in the IR you have a much larger symmetry. The much larger symmetry might have a, its own anomaly. In fact, I'm soon going to give an example. There would be a new symmetry in the IR, and it has an anomaly, and it has nothing to do with anything in the, in the UV. That's correct. Is it still true that all projective reps are still such anomalies in higher dimensions? That? I haven't done it yet. So if you could hold with your question until I go to higher dimensions, I'll be delighted to answer that. The, yeah. Many, but not all, anomalies in higher dimensions can be detected either as a projective representation of the system or as a projective representation of the system with defects. That's very important that we add also the defects. For all I know, that does not exhaust all of them. And we'll have examples. There was a question here. Uh, you could have some uh, part of the symmetry in the UV, which goes to, like, uh, under this homomorphism goes to tubular. Right? Can that part of the UV symmetry have an anomaly? The trivial? Ah, excellent. So the kernel of the map cannot have anomalies, because the UV person will not know how to represent them. So actually, I, since I was corrected about phi, where was it? I think this is usually denoted as one. It's the trivial element of the group G. OK, so this brings me to the next topic, which was supposed to so now I'm about halfway through my through the plan for yesterday. And I'm going to ask again, how many people of you seen anything about the C equals one compact Bosa? Well, this result is inconsistent with what we had yesterday. <laughs> the only explanation I have is that between yesterday and today, you learned it. No? Sorry? That's correct, yeah. OK. So for those people who were embarrassed not to raise their hand, let me give a lightning review. So we had the Lagrangian. I wrote it there. We can write it in any one of the three presentations I had. And the symmetry is u1, which I called momentum, u1 winding. There's a semi-direct. So the momentum in winding is the high energy physics slash string theory terminology. In condensed matter physics, this is referred to as charge, and this is referred to as vorticity. So this is just kind of a dictionary. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll be using the momentum to winding terminology just because this is how I grew up. But for the purpose of this talk, these talks, the momentum terminology is actually quite confusing because we'll have momentum in space time. And this is the momentum in the target space. So I'll try to be careful with the terminology. And there are operators, L0 and L0 bar, which give us the, so the theory is conformal. It has a conformal algebra. 
And in my convention, there's a QM over R plus R QW square plus dot, dot, dot oscillators. And for the right movers, we have QM over R minus R QW square plus dot, dot, dot coming from the oscillators. And QM and QW are both integers associated with the UM times UW. How many of you have heard that before? Ah, oh, wonderful. Now, in many applications, especially in condensed matter physics, uh, we start at show distances with another symmetry, not this one, a smaller one. So there's less symmetry in the UV. The term that sometimes appear in reference to that, and that again relates to a question I was asked yesterday, what do I do, is the name that usually is associated with that is the XY model. As always, I make a mess. So, a typical example is a model of rotors, which I will soon discuss in a lot of detail. But imagine that's what we have in the UV. So that's the UV system, symmetry. And we found parameters such and we landed it in the IR on this new symmetry. G, uh, this is our GIR and this is our GUV. So let me draw the map of what the spectrum looks like. There's a parameter R. And this is the point r equals 2. When r is bigger than 2, all the operators that carry winding have L0 and L0 bar larger than 1. And consequently, all the operators that carry the winding charge are irrelevant. So now we are very sim in a situation very similar to what we had in the quantum mechanical example of the particle on the ring. The UV person has only one U1. The IR person says, oh, I have two U1. One of them is exact, and the other is approximate. It's approximate because it is violated by these winding carrying operators. So if I try to perturb the system by breaking one of the winding, by breaking the winding symmetry, all the renormalization group flow goes like this, takes me back to this point. And therefore, we have an emergent symmetry at long distances. For smaller values of R, so I can actually write the operator. In the notation I had yesterday with the winding operator, I can write it as e to the i theta. It carries winding charge 1 is relevant. And therefore, here, the flow is away, and the system is gapped. Who knows what's the name of this point? It has a name. SU2 point? The convention where the winding charge one operator is irrelevant here and relevant here. That's one way to define the convention. The other way to define the convention is what I wrote here. But somebody here said the right answer. It's called the BKT. And it was good enough to deserve a Nobel Prize. So, <clears throat> sorry? Look it up. <laughs> I think it was actually earlier. But I don't think he fully understood. But anyway, I think he's also dead. That, that I'm actually, I shouldn't say that in a recorded thing. I, I'm not sure. 
So in here, we have an emergent symmetry. Here, the system is gapped. So that's an example of how the emergent symmetry could be larger, but approximate. Now, imagine I change the system, and and impose the same U1 momentum that we had before, and add also Z2 winding. I'll write it like that. Here the parentheses don't matter. So in the UV, I excluded operators with winding charge 1, but I do allow operators with winding charge 2. I also exclude operators with winding charge 3, but I allow operators with winding charge 4. So I did some fine tuning. That's straightforward to do on the lattice. I tune one parameter to kill this operator. And I look at the same analysis here again. Do I have a colored chalk? Yeah. Now, the fact that e to the i theta is relevant doesn't matter, because e to the i theta is excluded by an exact symmetry in the UV. Instead, I'm going to a point here, which happens to be at r equals 1. And here, e to the 2i theta is relevant. So in this range, this guy is relevant, but he's, it is totally harmless, because we excluded it by hand. We tuned, we tuned it uh, not to be there in the action. And therefore, in the low energy theory, it's not there. E to the i, 2i theta is still irrelevant here. So the e to the 2i theta, which is in this color, is still irrelevant. But here, the e to the 2i theta becomes relevant, and the system is gapped. So the BKT transition moves from r equals 2 to r equals 1. And how did I find r1 and 2? I just substituted here the appropriate values, and I set the L0 and L0 bar to be 1. And then there are special interesting points in between, which I'm sure you heard about. For example, there is a point here, which is in blue. Here, the theory is the same as the theory of free fermions. And that's at r equals root 2. And at r equals 1, we have an enhanced symmetry. We have an SO4 global symmetry, which such that in that point, at that point, the IR symmetry is even bigger. It's not just U1 times U1 semi-direct Z2, but it is enlarged to SO4. And there's an exact duality that flips R to 1 over R and exchanges the momentum and winding. Now, this whole messy blackboard is an anomaly. And the anomaly is a mixed anomaly between these two guys. There's a mixed anomaly between these two. Any one of them separately doesn't have an anomaly, but there's a mixed anomaly between them which I thought I would, I'm actually going to skip it now. I'm not going to discuss it, because I'll do it later from a different perspective. That would address the question that was asked earlier, I think, by Saul. Somebody asked me. So here I mentioned, I didn't explain it, but I mentioned it. And later, I will discuss it in more detail. A little bit of history. This anomaly, not quite in that language, was first discussed by Schwinger. And the anomaly of the projective representation was this, usually the reference is to Wigner, but I'm told that it was understood even earlier, the quantum mechanics. Hilbert space could be in a projective representation. So there's nothing new here. Wigner was almost 100 years ago. And Schwinger must have been in the 60s or 70s. So it's also quite ancient. But I would like to take this discussion in a different direction. Any questions so far? Yeah. This is a mixed anomaly between the two U1s. And one of the U1s is preserved in the UV. 
Yeah. Is there any sense of anomaly matching between? No. Okay. No. You only match those anomalies that exist both in the UV and in the IR. You cannot match anomalies between anomalies in symmetries that do not exist. The word matching means that you have to match them. Now, when we get symmetries that are a little bit more involved, some fine print will have to be added. But the quick answer is no, you shouldn't match them. And when I said that, this is not to say that it's not being done today by various people. OK. So now I'm going to be a high energy physicist, thinking like a condensed matter physicist. And one of the main ingredients that is common in condensed matter physics and not common in high energy physics is to take this beautiful relativistic system and consider it with a chemical potential. The high energy physicists are interested in the standard model or you know, dark matter. They really study chemical potential. We would like to see how the chemical potential changes the system. And, but I'm going to do it in the continuum version. No lattice, because whatever I'm going to say, I still need that, I won't need that. Whatever I'm going to say can be done on the lattice, and if I have enough time, I'll do it. But since the majority of you are high energy physicists, I'll do it first in the continuum, and we'll see a real surprise. So we take the same system, and there's a momentum charge, which is an integral. In the conventions I use, it's r squared over 2 pi, integral from 0 l. So I have the system is on a circle of length l with periodic boundary conditions, dx, dt, phi. Or I can write it as 1 over 2 pi, integral from 0 to l, dx, dx theta. That's in one of the presentations I had yesterday. So that's the charge. And now I'm going to add a chemical potential. How do I add a chemical potential? I take the same Lagrangian. I think I'm going to take the third one that I used before. So I have 1 over 4 pi r squared dt theta quantity squared minus dx theta squared. So that's what we had before. But now I'm going to add the chemical potential. And the chemical potential is a term linear in dx theta. And I'm free to add a constant to my Lagrangian. So I'm putting here 2 pi q over L. So I introduced a parameter q. So q, with this normalization, was introduced such that it is dimensionless. And this whole thing is the chemical potential. So that's the chemical potential I introduce. So I introduced the chemical potential, but it's completely clear that that's not going to do anything exciting. For simplicity, let, me, let Q be quantized. So if Q is quantized, I can just change variables to theta goes to theta plus 2 pi Q over Lx. If I do that, then I, un I remove that term. In terms of the new theta, this term is absent. In the study of conformal field theory, this is known as spectral flow. And we can do it even when q is not an integer. What the change of variables does is to say that the new variable theta does not have periodic boundary conditions. How many of you heard of spectral flow? OK, so you recognize this as the spectral flow transformation. And therefore, you are not shocked that it mapped the system to itself. So when q is an integer, the chemical potential has zero effect. And when q is not an integer, it's the same as the original problem, but with twisted boundary conditions. So locally, it's still the same. But now, let's move to the other blackboard. Where, where was it here? where the U1 winding is not a symmetry. So I'm going to take this system with, with or without the chemical potential and deform it further. I have to close the parentheses. Nobody gets credit for correcting me here. Lambda 
cosine theta. So I added the winding chart one operator to the action. First, without the chemical potential, that's what we did here, is we vary the radius. For large radius, the added term is harmless or more technically irrelevant. For R below two, it is relevant and it gaps the system. So that's when Q is zero. So what did we analyze? We analyzed first this system. That's on the blackboard there. And we analyze this system, saying, ah, that's the same as spectral flow. This doesn't do anything. But now let's do the two together. So we want to understand this system. So what do we have? We have a system with the U1 symmetry, the momentum symmetry. We had a chemical potential for that U1 symmetry. And we do not impose the winding symmetry. But I'm still using the same. So this is the harmful term. So let's use the same change of variables. So what we have now is 1 over 4 pi r square dt. You can't read here. So 1 over 4 pi r square dt theta square minus dx theta square, and I close the parentheses, plus lambda cosine theta plus 2 pi q x over l. Question so far? Some sanity check. If lambda equals 0, nothing changed. If q equals 0, also nothing changed. It's the same as the problem without the, the shift. And what should we say about this operator? OK, what we did over there here is when we turn on this operator, we said we should check whether it's relevant or irrelevant. If the operator is irrelevant, it doesn't do anything at long distances. But if the operator is relevant, it gaps the system. But here we see something new. This operator might or might not be relevant, but it carries so let me write it as e to the i theta plus 2 pi qx over l. So it carries q winding equals 1, but also spatial momentum p, not to be confused with the target space momentum, which I called qm which is q over l, 2 pi q over l. So this operator violates translation symmetry in our action. And that happened because of the redefinition we did. Originally, it was here. It didn't violate translation symmetry. The change of variables Remove the, cup, the term from here, introduce it here. Now it violates translation symmetry. But I'm an IR person. I, this thing originally wasn't there. I have my own definition of translation. I just move from one place to the other. And don't confuse me with various operators that I don't see in my action. And now I'm adding this guy. And this guy carries spatial momentum of order q. So let's see what happens if this Q is very large, a trillion. So if Q is a trillion, the low energy observer says, I have an operator which is either relevant or irrelevant, but it is dressed with e to the i q x over L, e to the i q x over L. So this operator oscillates very rapidly in space. So if I compute correlation functions of operators with low momentum, Momentum conservation is going to tell me that the effect of this operator is exactly 0. So this operator, as it stands, might be relevant or irrelevant, but it has no consequences in the low energy theory. Nominally, so it's, it might seem like it's outside the standard picture of the renormalization group. Because we have an operator which might be relevant, but it's totally ineffective in the low energy theory. 
if you understand more carefully what's going on here, you can phrase it as saying that the short distance person sees momentum, no winding, and translation symmetry. There are two momentum symmetries, one momentum in the target space and one momentum in space. The low energy person sees a new symmetry, winding symmetry, which we're going to violate. But the way it is violated is in conjunction with spatial translation. And what the low energy observer describes as spatial translation is not what the long short distance observer describes as spatial translation. And while the operator that we added, this guy, carries vanishing UV momentum, it carries very large IR momentum. So the upshot of all that is that as long as we don't go to energies of order Q, the effect of this operator is completely null. And in fact, this picture is no longer valid. And we kill the BKT transition. So even though I can make the, if the radius is big, there's nothing to argue about. But even if the radius is small, the BKT transition is killed by the existence of the chemical potential. And it seems like we get a symmetry out of nowhere. We refer to it as an eminent symmetry. Because it emanates from the UV translation. This symmetry really started its life as UV translation. And UV translation is an exact symmetry of the problem. So we get a new symmetry in the IR, which is eminent. I want to emphasize that this symmetry does not follow the rules of emergent symmetries that I was so careful to define earlier. I said earlier in the level of the, in the particle on the ring that the low energy observer sees a new symmetry, SO3. But if they look too, very closely at the system and they measure things very accurately, they see that the SO3 is not exact and it's violated, but only O2 or Z2 times Z2, depending on the problem, is an exact symmetry. The full of the other, the other elements in SO3 are violated by irrelevant operators. The same is true for baryon number in the standard model. We look for those higher dimension operators that violate it. And the same is true here for the winding symmetry. The winding symmetry here is an emergent symmetry. And when we look at low, the low energy observer says, yeah, the momentum symmetry is exact, but the winding symmetry appears to be exact. But if I look more carefully, I see that it's violated by irrelevant operators. It's only approximate. This is not the case here, in our case. Here, even when the operator is nominally irrelevant, so the radius is big, you can do experiments all day, and you're not going to detect the, fa the violation of the symmetry. It's not being violated by irrelevant operators. The operators that would violate it are irrelevant, but they carry very high momentum and experiments with low, with, you scatter particles with fixed momentum, or you can look at correlation functions with fixed momentum, IR momentum. If you look at the correlation functions of them, the violation due to this symmetry are exactly zero. That's hard to accept at the first time. In fact, people ask me earlier, how, how can that be? To get somebody in this thing, but that's an example. So this is an example of a symmetry that exists in the IR. Where was my summary of, last, of yesterday? I erased it. It's a symmetry that exists in the IR, is not there in the UV, and it's not approximate. It's actually an exact symmetry. And that raises the question that I think you asked me before. Should we match it between the UV and the IR? Because it looks like it's more sacred than the regular symmetries? And the answer is yes. So that we have to find what is it in the UV that reflects this symmetry and is associated, with, especially if it has an anomaly, is associated with that. So that's one question. The second question I would like to ask is why did this happen? 
So I, the algebra is really elementary, but it looks very surprising. How did we get a symmetry out of nowhere? How do we know that what we are doing is correct? And in the spirit of these talks, there must be an underlying anomaly. There must be an anomaly underlying it that guarantees that we find this effect. Questions? That's correct. So in the case of higher form symmetries, you can argue whether you should call them eminent or not, because they are not violated by irrelevant operators. But unlike these symmetries, they do not emanate from anything. So you, we can argue about how to define it. In fact, in our paper, we pointed that out, and we left open the question of whether we should refer to it as an eminent symmetry or not, because it is indeed not violated by any local operators. But it does not emanate from anything. And maybe I should really defer this question to the people who discuss higher form symmetries. There will be no higher form symmetry. It's not that I don't like higher form symmetries. I love them, but they will not be in these talks. It's kind of surprising that the anomaly signals that there is some symmetry not in the Yuri but in IR. That's correct. Yep. I'm going, to, I'm going to explain how this thing happened. Where, where is there an anomaly, right? We don't even have the symmetry. How can we get an anomaly in something that is, yeah, such that this thing will be explained? That, that's the next thing I'm going to explain. And it, you, you're completely right that the way I've set it up, it looks almost impossible. So you have to hold Q over L fixed. In fact, this is actually the natural thing to do in condensed matter physics, because Q is kind of the total charge of the system. So you would like to keep the, the charge density fixed, not the charge. Yeah. If you hold the total charge fixed and you make the system bigger, you dilute this effect. So it's completely consistent with what you wanted. OK, so in order to address these questions, all these questions, we have to take a slightly broader view. And let's imagine more generally. We are in one plus one dimension. I'm not going to assume relativistic invariance or anything. I'll do that in the continuum, but it can be done equally well on the lattice. And what I'm going to do is put together a lot of things that all of you know very well, but I'll phrase them in a slightly different way to make it clear. So we have a system that has a U1 global symmetry. This is what appeared before as U1M with a charge Q. And we also have translation symmetry with charge P, also known as the momentum. And if we have a symmetry Q, we can twist the boundary conditions by Q. So what I'm going to say is that the system has size L. I have size L here. Yeah, if I have the system size, let, let x be x is identified with x plus 2 pi, so I don't need to worry about the charges. If I have an operator O at x plus 2 pi, it is e to the 2 pi i times sigma times i sigma times q, q is a bad choice. So we have an operator O with charge R. R is an integer, because it's a charge of that. And we impose twisted boundary conditions. So as we go around the space, all the operators come rotated by phase e to the i sigma. In the language I introduced yesterday, this is turning on background u1 gauge field in the spatial direction. Yesterday, we were in quantum mechanics. We could turn on background gauge fields only in the time direction. 
Today we are in one plus one dimension, so we can also turn on background fields in the space direction. But if you find that too abstract, think of it as twisted boundary conditions. And now I'm going to compute the partition function, generalizing what I did yesterday. So it's a function of beta, the inverse temperature, sigma, which I defined here, xi, which I'll define in a second, and theta is a bad. OK, I'll call it also. I'll call it this lowercase theta. Trace, one problem with this topic is that we very quickly run out of fonts. Uh, trace, e to the minus beta h, and the Hamiltonian might depend on the twist, depending on how you set it up. And we put here various charges, q times c, and e to the i, theta times p. So let me unpack it. Euclidean space-time is a torus. The twist in the space direction, the u1 twist in the space direction is sigma. Is this visible from the back? Yes. And is this only a flat H field? So far, it, I put flat. Yeah, I can do more generally with non-flat. But since I want to be elementary, let's just put flat. In fact, I'll get all the mileage just out of flat fields. If, if it's not flat, is it still like the conditions? No, because then you have to specify more information. Okay. But whatever you do in space, if it's independent of time, it's flat. So let's make things, let's keep translation invariance in time, and then we don't need to answer this question. So. Spa Euclidean space-time is a torus with periodic boundary conditions. The shift here is what I denoted as theta. In conformal field theory, it's usually denoted as tau 1. So we compute the trace over the Hilbert space, and then we shift by theta. This is what this guy is doing. The spatial component of the gauge field is sigma here, and the spatial component in the and the time component of the gauge field is C. So this thing is exactly as we discussed yesterday in quantum mechanics. A time component of the gauge field can be, inter can be represented not by changing the Hamiltonian, but by putting the charge with the appropriate thing. And I think we even used the same character, C, yesterday. OK, so what did we do? We twisted the boundary conditions by sigma. We can also instead have untwisted boundary conditions and modify the Hamiltonian. So sigma resides either here or in the boundary conditions. This is the spatial gauge field. This is the time gauge field. And this is this momentum which shifts what we call tau 1. So this is an object that I'm sure you have seen in your conformal field theory study. This is the partition function on the torus. I'm not going to assume relativistic invariance. And therefore, I'm not going to assume there's any modular transformation. I'm only going to assume the consequences of non-relativistic uh, system. So what are the consequences that we have? Z of beta and sigma plus 2 pi. Let's shift sigma by 2 pi. Beta. That means that I rotated by 2 pi. The twisted boundary conditions couldn't care less. And I should come back to where I started. Second, I can shift C by 2 pi. All the charges in the spectrum are integers. Since all the charges are integers, look at the trace. I can shift, I can shift C by 2 pi. It makes no difference. However, one relation is interesting. Imagine I shift theta by 2 pi. If I shift theta by 2 pi, what happens? This is not here, but it goes up to here. So the torus is kind of more slanted. And we know that e to the 2 pi i p, that's the operator that translates me all the way around in space. Because of the twisted boundary conditions, it's a non-trivial operator. 
because of the twisted boundary conditions, this is the same as e to the i sigma times the charge q. This is the statement that we have twisted boundary conditions. Twisted boundary condition is a statement that complete translation of space acts on the Hilbert space with this operator. That's completely known. And in fact, you use such things when you studied conformal field theory and you wrote the, the torus partition function and you put the uh, chemical potentials or background U1 charges and you had all these relations of the theta functions, this equation appears all the time. What does this mean for our partition function? It means that z of beta, sig so when I shifted sigma of c by 2 pi, nothing exciting happened. But when I shift theta goes to theta plus 2 pi, so as z of beta, sigma, c is shifted by sigma, and theta goes back to itself. Because when I shift theta by 2 pi, I get from here e to the 2 pi i p. And e to the 2 pi i p is the same as e to the i sigma q. And therefore, I shift sigma, I shift c by sigma. In fact, if you look at your notes from your conformal field theory course, or from string theory, and you look at the torus partition function, you will find this equation there. This is the transformation usually denoted by t. Tau goes to tau plus 1. And when you do this transformation, the coefficient of the charge in the time direction is shifted, simply because it measures the holonomy from here to here. This is sigma, and this is xi. But if we shift sigma by 2 pi, we want to go back to the same place. We have to go along sigma and then along xi. So that's kind of another way of understanding it. So we have three identities, number one, number two, number three. And I haven't told you what the system is. It doesn't matter. Any system that has U1 symmetry and translation, this is true. I emphasize there is no anomaly here. The only thing which is slightly unusual is this equation. The rest is completely trivial. But there is no anomaly. And the way to see that there is no anomaly is there is no phase. An anomaly is a phase in all these transformations of the partition function, but there isn't any. What does it tell us? It tells us that the partition function is a function. So beta just goes along for the ride. There are three parameters here, sigma, xi, and theta. Sigma is a circle. Xi is a circle. And theta is a circle. However, the parameter space is not T3. The parameter space is more complicated. The parameter space is such that as we move around, we can think of the base as being T2. But as we move around, the other circle is twisted around. This three-dimensional manifold, which is not T3, it's a T1 fibered over a T2, that manifold is known as the Heisenberg manifold. However, the partition function is a good function on that manifold. Right? No phase. As I go move around the, the space, by space I mean the parameter space, sigma, xi, and theta, the partition function remains single valued, except that as I move around, I don't come back to where I thought I am, but I come back shifted a little bit, because the space is a little bit more complicated. Now let's try to imitate what we did with the chemical potential. The partition function here is a system with a U1 symmetry. And in the trace, we summed over states with all possible U1 charges. So instead of introducing a chemical potential, I'm going to restrict the system, I restrict the trace to be a sum over states with fixed charge. Not with fixed chemical potential, with fixed charge. It makes no difference because the system is going to be very large anyway. So I need to define z 
sub Q, the same Z, where all I do in the trace is sum only over those states that have fixed Q. Right, so I kind of put a chronic delta. If, if the charge Q, big Q, is not equal to little Q, don't sum over this state. If they are equal, include them in the sum. Naively, what I need to do is integrate the partition function we had before with all the arguments in Xi, integrate it over Xi with e to the i q Xi. And I put it in quotation mark for the reasons I will soon explain. So that would be the first attempt. We're given a function of all these variables. And how am I going to project on fixed charge? I put e to the i Xi q in the partition function, and I integrate over Xi, and that would be a Kronecker delta setting the operator Q equals to the C number of little Q. However, this formula is wrong. This formula is wrong because Xi is not a circle that we can easily integrate over. And I'll demonstrate that very clearly. Actually, instead of uh, demonstrating it, let me just do it. So if I take this z here, and I multiply it by e to the i x c q, actually I have to put a minus sign here, and I multiply it by e to the minus x q, this object is a good function on our parameter space. But this one is not. Because see what happens in our parameter space shift theta by 2 pi, xi should be shifted by sigma. This is true for this, function, this factor, but it's not true for this. This factor is such that if I shift theta by 2 pi, it doesn't change. So the integrand here is not a good function on our space, and therefore I cannot integrate over it. You might feel a little bit uneasy. This looks like fancy math. In reality, we can have the trace only over the fixed charge. So what is he talking about? Right? Take the trace and don't sum over all the charges. That take those that you really want to pick over. And what that means in practice, or saying it in a fancier way, we need to relax the periodicity of this function z. So we work on the covering space. So we had the three parameter, sigma, xi, and theta. And we go to the covering space. On the covering space, there is no problem. Then I can multiply by e to the minus i c q. And then I can do the integral. If I do that, it's easy to see that the function we get is a sigma of beta, sigma. C is gone. C is gone. We still have theta. But if I shift theta by 2 pi, I get e to the i sigma q zq of beta, sigma, and theta. So I'm going to make several comments about this expression. What am I saying here first? That if I took the trace there as is, and I summed only over states with fixed charge, it's a well-defined thing to do. I get a function. But if I shift theta by 2 pi, I don't get the same function. I get the same function multiplied by a phase. And you can check that this is true. In fact, how did we derive this fact here, that when you shift theta by 2 pi, c is shifted by sigma? I use this operator equation. And this operator equation can still be used in the, Hilbert sp in the subspace of all the states with big charge being little q. And if I use that in the charge being little q subspace, and I get this phase out. This is one way to, to see this expression. Another way to understand that is that when we have twisted boundary conditions, the eigenvalues of p are not integers are in sigma over 2 pi plus an integer. 
So when we have twisted boundary conditions, the eigenvalues of P of the momentum are fractional. More mathematically, this means that if now think of the parameter space as being just two torus with sigma in Q, sorry, with sigma in theta, okay, two. <clears throat> here I misspoke a little bit. Here I need to put the charge of the state. Okay, let me not put it here. I'll soon fix this equation. The, we have a two torus parameterized by two circles, sigma and theta, but the partition function is not a function on that space, but instead it's a section of a line bundle with churn class little q. That's very important that little q is an integer. What this really means is that if we have an operator with charge r, because of the twisted boundary conditions, it, its momentum is going to be quantized with a shift. And all the states are going to have momentum which is shifted by sigma q plus an integer, maybe over 2 pi. So in the presence of the twisted bound, the state of have fractional momentum. This is well known. So all the facts are well known, except that I wrap them together in this formula, which is also actually known. So the fact that with twisted boundary conditions, the states and the operators have fractional momentum. That you should have learned in your conformal field theory class. We put it here in this form. Now it starts looking more like an anomaly. We have a partition function, and we perform a transformation which, had, which we thought should be trivial, but we get a phase out. So the UV person and the IR person, and then we finish. The UV person says, this is a property of the partition function. We have a complicated Hilbert space, complicated Hamiltonian. All I assumed was translation symmetry and U1 symmetry. I twisted the boundary conditions with the U1 symmetry, and I put a chemical potential, or I restricted the tension to states with fixed Q. And then I learned that the partition function had that phase. Now I come to the IR person. The IR person has no idea what the microscopic Hamiltonian is. But that phase should still be true. One way to say that, I drag this parameter beta around. Let me send beta to infinity. When beta is very large, I'm focusing on the low-lying states. When beta is very large, I'm only looking at the low-lying states. I only see what the low-energy observer sees. And the low-energy observer should have a partition function with the same phase. If we have only one ground state, which is gap, nothing interesting in the infrared, we are not going to get that phase. So the system with the chemical potential cannot be a trivially gapped state. The system with the chemical potential must be more interesting. And it could, must be more interesting in order to reflect this quote unquote anomaly. So now we go back to the example we had before with cosine theta. It fits the framework of this discussion. We had a U1 symmetry. We introduced the chemical potential. And naively, depending on the radius of the system, it could be gapped or not. This general discussion excludes the possibility that it's trivially gapped. That cannot happen. And the way it, it is realized there is that we have a new eminent symmetry, and the new eminent symmetry has an anomaly, and that anomaly reflects this UV anomaly. So this answers the question that you asked me. If we didn't have any symmetry there, where did this come from? So the answer is that it started its life, this eminent symmetry started its life with microscopic translation, and microscopic translation does not have an anomaly, but it does have an anomaly if we work at fixed charge. And I hope I answered your question. So I'll continue tomorrow. If you have any questions, please come and talk to me. It might stimulate something I'll say early in the talk tomorrow. Thank you. I think it's time, right? Are you waiting?
me to say something? Any more questions for Navi? So coffee, anyway, we coffee. have another coffee break. The schedule will be the same every day. Coffee break after the first and third lectures and, and lunch break in between the second and third. So.